gentleman is recognized. To my Republican colleagues who introduced this resolution, I thank you. You honor me with your enmity. You flatter me with this falsehood. You, who are the authors of a big lie about the last election, must condemn the truth-tellers, and I stand proudly before you. Your words tell me that I have been effective in the defense of our democracy, and I am grateful. And yet this false and defamatory resolution comes at a considerable cost to the country and to the Congress. At a moment when millions of people in our home state of California are unable to find a place to live or afford a place to live, Speaker McCarthy chooses to occupy the resources of Congress for two straight weeks on this hollow sop to the MAGA crowd. He offers nothing to those who are homeless or addicted to opioids or to millions of college students mired in debt but this paltry distraction. Donald Trump is under indictment for actions that jeopardize our national security, and McCarthy would spend the nation's time on petty political payback, thinking he can censure or fine Trump's opposition into submission. But I will not yield. Not one inch. The cost to the Speaker's delinquency is high, but the cost to Congress of this frivolous and yet dangerous resolution may be even higher as it represents another serious abuse of power. Donald Trump has threatened that any of you that defy him and vote against this partisan resolution will be met by a primary challenge. And he calls for my imprisonment. If a transient majority can punish and attempt to silence members who hold a corrupt president to account, there is no telling what further corruption of office will follow. And I say this to Speaker McCarthy and others who wish to gratify Donald Trump with this act of subservience or bend to his demands. Try as you might to expel me from Congress or silence me with a $16 million fine, you will not succeed. You might as well make it $160 million. You will never deter me from doing my duty. There he is, Adam Schiff. Censored by Republicans yesterday, but he didn't seem to be too upset about it. And vindication at this baseless stunt yesterday by the House Republicans to weaponize the House censor rule by wrongly targeting him, thus making him more powerful than ever before. He is running for U.S. Senate. All of his colleagues in the House floor were there cheering for him and shaming Kevin McCarthy. That from yesterday was a really big deal. I've got Jared Yeager. Sexton joining me coming up in a minute, but let me just play a few more clips because there was a lot going on yesterday, and in case you didn't hear it, it's certainly worth hearing again, both the Adam uh, Schiff's censure floor speeches and the absolute demolition of the former special prosecutor John Durham, mostly by Democrats, by some Republicans as well. I got to play a couple of those clips. But here is Nancy Pelosi yesterday at the Adam Schiff censorship extravaganza. Today we are on the floor of the House where the other side has turned this this chamber where slavery was abolished, where Medicare and Social Security and everything were instituted. They've turned it into a puppet show, a puppet show. And you know what? The puppeteer, Donald Trump, is shining a light on the strings. You look miserable. You look miserable. The only advantage to all of this is that instead of reversing what we did on the IRA to save the planet or reversing what we did to reduce the cost of prescription drugs, you're wasting time. All right. Well, now here's the guy who replaced her as House Minority Leader. This is Hakeem Jeffries on the censure of Adam Schiff. All the Democrats were in the chamber yesterday. Clearly. As this resolution demonstrates, extreme MAGA Republicans work for the twice impeached, disgraced former president of the United States of America, the insurrectionist in chief, the extreme puppet master who clearly ordered that this fake, phony and fraudulent resolution be brought to the floor today after it failed last week. In fact, the Supreme Puppet Master even threatened the other side of the aisle with primaries if they didn't bend the knee. And when he says bend the knee, extreme MAGA Republicans say how high. Adam Schiff has done nothing wrong. 
Adam Schiff is a good man. Adam Schiff has served this country with distinction. I think, though, my favorite was this from Congressman Daniel Goldman. Gentlemen, is recognized. One of my colleagues says, we will hold members accountable. You are the party of George Santos. Who are you holding accountable? The guy is an alleged and acknowledged liar and indicted, and you protect him every day. Don't lecture us with your projection and your defense of Donald Trump. It's pathetic, and it's beneath you, and it's beneath this body, and I yield back. Oh, yeah, Daniel Goldman, everybody. And you know who else took a lot of heat yesterday is John Durham, the special counsel who investigated the FBI's probe of ties between Russia and Donald Trump's 2016 campaign, found himself at the center of a heated political fight as he appeared before a congressional committee Wednesday with Democrats denouncing his inquiry and Republicans arguing that its findings help prove anti-Trump bias within law enforcement. Although, of course, that's not the case. That's the Associated Press. This was an exciting hearing where, like I said, even Republicans went after him. Uh, Let's start, however, back with Adam Schiff. And I'm going to play the full five minutes. Folks say they like when I do long clips, and I think this is worth it. This is in the public's interest, and here he goes with the complete exchange between uh, Representative Adam Schiff, who is running for Senate in California, and John Durham, who was the special prosecutor appointed by Bill Barr, and uh, came up pretty much empty. Mr. Durham, uh, just so people remember what this is all about, let me ask you, the Mueller investigation revealed that Russia interfered in the 2016 election in sweeping and systemic fashion, correct? That's correct. And Russia did so through a social media campaign that favored Donald Trump and disparaged Hillary Clinton, correct? The report says, yes. And Mueller found that a Russian intelligence service hacked computers associated with the Clinton campaign and then released the stolen documents publicly. Is that right? That report speaks for itself as well. Mueller also reported that though he could not establish the crime of conspiracy beyond a reasonable doubt, He also said, quote, a statement that the investigation did not establish certain facts does not mean there was no evidence of those facts. That also appears in the report, doesn't it? It's the language to that effect, yes. In fact, you cited that very statement in your own report, did you not, as a way of distinguishing between proof beyond a reasonable doubt and evidence that falls short of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Correct. As an illustration of this, both Mueller and congressional investigations found that Trump's campaign chairman Paul Manafort was secretly meeting with an operative linked to Russian intelligence named Konstantin Kalimnik, correct? That's my understanding, yes. And that Manafort, while chairman of the Trump campaign, gave that Russian intelligence operative the campaign's internal polling data, correct? That's what I've read in the news, yes. And that Manafort provided this information to Russian intelligence while Russian intelligence was engaged in that social media campaign and the release of stolen documents to help the Trump campaign, correct? You may be getting beyond the depth of my knowledge, but... Well, let me me say very simply, while Manafort, the campaign chairman for Donald Trump, was giving this Russian intelligence officer internal campaign polling data, Russian intelligence was helping the Trump campaign, weren't they? I, I don't I don't know that. You I really don't, don't know right. those very basic facts of the investigation? I know the general um, facts, yes. Do I know that particular fact myself? No. I mean, I know that I've read that in the media. And are you aware, uh, Mr. Durham, that Mueller and congressional investigations also revealed that Don Jr. was informed that a Russian official was offering the Trump campaign, quote, very high-level and sensitive information, unquote, That would be incriminating if Hillary Clinton was part of, quote, Russia and its government support of Mr. Trump. Are you aware of that? Sure. People get phone calls all the time from uh, individuals who claim to have information like that. Really, the son of a presidential candidate gets calls all the time from a foreign government offering dirt on their opponent. Is that what you're saying? I don't think this is unique in your experience. Uh, So you you have other instances of the Russian government offering dirt on uh, a presidential candidate to the presidential candidate's son. Is that what you're saying? Would you repeat the question? Uh, you said that it's not uncommon to get offers of help from a hostile foreign government in a presidential campaign directed at the president's son. You really stand by that, Mr. Durham? I'm saying that, it, that people can make phone calls um, making uh, claims uh, all the time that you may have experienced. Are you really trying to diminish 
the significance of what happened here and the secret meeting that the president said son set up in Trump Tower to receive that incriminating information? Are you trying to diminish the significance of that, Mr. Turner? I'm not trying to diminish it at all, but I think the more complete story is that they met and it was a ruse and they didn't talk about Mrs. Clinton. Uh, and, and you think it's insignificant that he had a secret meeting with the Russian delegation for the purpose of getting dirt on Hillary Clinton and the only disappointment expressed in that meeting was that the dirt they got wasn't better. You don't think that's significant? I don't think that that was a well-advised thing to do. Oh, no. oh, not, not well-advised. Right. Well, that's, that's the understatement of the year. So you think it's perfectly appropriate or, or maybe just ill-advised for a presidential campaign to secretly meet with a Russian delegation to get dirt on their opponent? You would merely say that's inadvisable? Yeah, if you're asking me what I do, and I, don't, I hope I wouldn't do it, but it's, it was not illegal. Uh, it, was, it was stupid, foolish, ill-advised. Well, it, it is illegal to conspire to get uh, incriminating opposition research from a hostile government that is of financial value to a campaign. Wouldn't that violate campaign laws? I don't know. I don't know all those facts to be true. Well, your report, Mr. Durham, doesn't dispute anything Mueller found, did it? No, our, our object, our aim, was not to dispute Director Mueller. I have the greatest regard, highest regard for Director Mueller. He's a patriot. The only distinguishment between his investigation and yours <coughs> is he refused to bring charges where he couldn't prove guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and you did. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman. Damn. Adam Schiff, quite a performance yesterday with John Durham, and I highly recommend that you listen to some of the others as well as listen to Republican Matt Gates. I think that's beyond the scope of what's in the report. It's literally the scope of what your charging order is. Who put it in motion? We get after it was put in motion, the FBI did a bunch of wrong and corrupt things. Totally understand. We're trying to deal with that. But when you are part of the cover up, Mr. Durham, mm. then it makes our job harder. Yeah, well, if that's your thought, I mean, there's no way of dissuading you from that. I can tell you that it's offensive and that the people who worked on this investigation have spent their lives trying to protect the people in this country and pursue within the law you went what it is that we, two, can, we are Mr. authorized Wait, to do. You tried two cases, lost both of them, and then the one plea, guilty plea you got, Kleinsmith, Kleinsmith is back to practicing law in Washington, D.C. today. Yeah, that's beyond my control. Right, but, but the, f the fact that you allowed that plea to occur, right, and, and then the punishment was insufficient, the fact that you didn't, you didn't charge Andrew McCabe, you didn't convict the lying Democrats or the lying Russians, you didn't investigate Mifsud or the Mueller probe, even though, as we sit here today in black letter, that was your charge. Uh, have you ever heard of the Washington Generals? Uh, the Washington Generals, yes. Yeah, and, and they're the team that basically gets paid to show up and lose, right? Well, I, you know, I'm sure that the players who um, exert blood, sweat, and tears don't view it that way, but you might. I think they do. I think they do because the job of the Washington generals is to show up every night and to play the Harlem Globetrotters. And their job well, is thinking, to lose. I'm thinking, I'm sorry, of a different, I was thinking of a different Yeah, thing. yeah, so their job is to lose. And I'm kind of wondering, and, and it, just seem, it just seems so facially obvious that it's not what's in your report that's telling it's the omission. It's the lack of work you did. And for the people like the chairman who put trust in you, I think you let them down. I think you let the country down. And you are one of the barriers to the true accountability that we need. Do I get to respond to that or comment on that? Yeah. Well, I don't know if you've ever investigated a crime. Ah, where I found that clip got cut off. But here's a little bit more from Matt Gates with John Durham. He expended. Wait, why didn't you subpoena him to a grand jury? I'm sorry, why that? Why didn't you send him a grand jury subpoena? Mr. Mifsud? You'd have to find Mr. Mifsud before you could serve a grand jury subpoena on him. Well, you guys were out in Italy. Was it you and Bill Barr looking for authentic pasta over there or Mifsud? No, we, uh, we not. Um, we were looking for information that might help us locate Mifsud. But you know who I think could probably locate him? The features of, uh, of Western intelligence and possibly our own government that put him in play. I'm not sure exactly what that was about, but I thought it was interesting. Just the, the, the horror show that that was for John Durham yesterday, uh, a real embarrassment and a real uh, stain on whatever reputation that guy had before he did uh, Bill Barr's, thus Donald Trump's dirty work. And of course, in other news, huge uh, story from ProPublica dropped. I mean, you heard about this and I'm going to talk with Eric Siegel about it tomorrow and we'll get that up conversation as quickly as possible. So Sam Alito, 
uh, of the Supreme Court finds out that ProPublica is going to do a story talking about his billionaire's friends, uh, billionaires who had uh, issues before the court, who he hung out with. And so he tries to preempt it with a column in the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Alito himself. Well, the ProPublica piece comes out and it's bad. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito took a luxury fishing trip to Alaska with billionaire Paul Singer, whose hedge fund then had repeated business before the Supreme Court over the years that followed. A damning scoop about Alito hiding his billionaire private jet to Alaska fishing vacation arranged, of course, by the Federalist Society five hours after the Wall Street Journal publishes Alito's lame dismissal of the story. And here's Chris Hayes on MSNBC's All In, his show last night, talking with Zephyr Teachout. I thought this was a smart exchange about all of this. There's one more thing. I just wanted to get your, your thoughts on this, because this is what has struck me in both the Harlan Crow. When you read these, like, when you read this, the, 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 the sort of preposterous pre put out in the right. Wall Street Journal, right? There's this, like, very kind of, like, special pleading in the weeds yeah. nature to it, right? And it's like, wait a second, you're the person that sits in judgment of others, right? You sit in questions of statutory interpretation, of constitutional interpretation. You decide whether if people don't file their forms, they might still get the death penalty anyway. You you are the, up on the dais. This is, the, this is your judgment? This is how you apply your reasoning skills, your judgment, your common sense, and your interpretive ability to a set of rules says I can take the private jet trip. It's like, I don't know if you're that good at this. No, it's a, it's a crazy understanding of human nature to basically say, yes. um, you know, as you said, it's, it's neither friend, it's not fish or fowl, sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> it's neither friend nor stranger giving me, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in travel. And I trust myself that's to know right. whether I'm influenced. And that's just a, a violation of basic human nature. I trust myself to determine whether I'm influenced by this lavish trip. And how dare you, right. little one, you people out there, even question it. All right. There you go. Chris Hayes and Zephyr Teachout on MSNBC. I thought that was good. I'll talk with Eric Siegel more about Alito tomorrow. And I got to play you this. I don't know who this woman is. Her name is Charlie Arnold. And she was on Fox News with a show hosted by Kaylee McEnany. This piece, uh, this clip is flagged for us by the great Juliet Jeske at Decoding Fox News. And trigger alert. She's talking about the trans uh, activists, trans athletes, men and women. And that's the subject at hand. But uh, she says men are biologically superior to women. So here we go. Charlie, that was a thing of beauty. A mic drop moment. Right. (laughs) Fact checking the LGBT activists. Yeah, I mean, Riley makes a completely valid point. There's so many things about this discussion that makes you wonder how it's even being had in the first place. Men are biologically superior to women. This is not something that women would admit and feel like, oh, I, I, you know, I can't believe I just admitted that out loud. It's just something that is so blatantly obvious. They are stronger. They are tougher. They are faster. They are superior. Men are biologically superior to women. Stronger, faster, better. I mean, it's such, first of all, it's a ridiculous generalization. It's not true that all men are faster than women. There's plenty of women that are faster than men. Have you seen us? (laughs) Number one, (laughs) women also live longer on average to men due to biological differences. So I'd put them as superior by that measure. Julia Jeske made a list. Women also survive famines at a much higher rate than men do. All right. Women commit far less violent crime in every country all over the world. I mean, we can go on and on. My point is always like when we say that men are stronger or tougher, teach your kids this one. Tell people this. Uh, how do we measure strength? If you're talking about by arm wrestling or how much you bench, maybe in most cases, men are going to be stronger than women. But again, not all cases. Have you seen us? Who are we talking about? But if you measure strength in, uh, I think, uh, an alternatively and justifiable way by how much pain you can take. I think that person's really strong. Why? They they can take a lot of pain. They have a broken leg. They're not even crying over there laughing. A, uh, emotional pain. They they just had a terrible loss, and they're they're navigating it quite well. They're stoic. They can take a lot of emotional or physical pain. I think that's a pretty good measure of toughness 
and strength. And I think that women give birth to babies, men then don't. And then there's a whole thing called man flu. Come on, don't get me started. I think it's too late. All right. So there's that. Uh, well, now that we're done, I'm done with that rant. Let's uh, let's go to something positive. Yesterday, a new stamp, U.S. postal stamp, was revealed in case anybody still uses them. Now you get to use one with John Lewis's amazing face on it. And here's the un- at the unveiling of the stamp. Here is, again, the House Minority Leader, Hakeem Jeffries, who I will yield to for 30 seconds. It's a great honor and privilege on behalf of House Democrats to stand before all of you to pay tribute to a civil rights champion, defender of democracy, voice for the voiceless, legendary leader, and a powerful, profound, principled public servant, the Honorable John Lewis. The stamp will forever represent and commemorate one of our country's greatest sons and the conscience of our Congress. It's appropriate that one of our forever heroes will be recognized with a forever stamp. Yeah, a forever stamp. I like it. Okay, well, that's all I've got for you here in the opening. Lots of clips and lots of audio. And now it's time to get to my conversation with Jared Yates Sexton, who, of course, is a best-selling author and historian. He's huge on Twitter and Substack, where he writes at Dispatches from a Collapsing State. So go subscribe to that, as well as his podcast and Patreon with our friend Nick Hasselman, who they do a great job with the Muckrake podcast. Podcast. Subscribe to him on YouTube. All the links for Jared are in the show notes. Show notes. We start a conversation by talking about the fact that he took a week of like a silent retreat, kind of, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Of course, we talked about the Trump indictment and how he is changing his mind on some things and some of his latest work, as well as always, it's the great Jared Yates Sexton. Let's do it. All right, Jared Yates Sexton. Been too long. I mean, I wanted to get him on last week, and I couldn't get him on. My fault, I think, schedule-wise. He made himself available. I couldn't, I couldn't make it happen. I didn't have a shirt on or something. And then he's like, listen, I'm going on a silent retreat, so maybe we can do next week. So what is this? What is this nonsense, this silent retreat stuff? We need your voice. I want to hear from you. What are you doing? I talk too much. I talk too much. Like, we get paid to talk constantly listen i talk all the time you're on the air i think eight days a week at this point we talk too much occasionally i just want to shut up and not comment i will say though speaking of timing being bad i picked the beginning of my silent retreat to begin on the monday before donald fucking trump was indicted in court like i I, that's incredible now i made a bet to myself maybe i didn't know what it meant because we were just texting but i made a bet to myself i was like i get it I think that's a healthy thing to do. I've tried that. I tried it for, um, I think, a half an hour once, and I killed it. I was sleeping, but, but, but I thought, well, is he? Does that mean he's not going to tweet at all? So when you say silent retreat, were you not like? Do you mean you weren't not only not physically talking? I'm checking but you, out, my man. I'm not commenting. I'm not doing whatever. I'm I'm thinking things. I'm writing things down for myself. I'm. I mean, it's mostly an insular sort of a thing. Okay, I, well, I, let's. In, yeah, get into the why. I mean, like, we can sit yeah. here and say it's never good timing, given everything that's happening in the world, yeah. especially for someone that, like, frankly, let's be honest, your opinion on things is sought after, including by me. So, like, why bring, why did you do it? And, and kind of what did you do during this? And, and what are the benefits of it? So we have sort of, we, we've talked about some of these things before, but I'll go ahead and be more explicit about it. I think it's incredibly important. Every now and then, as we're doing this, to take a little bit of self-inventory and understand why we're doing it. Why are we what why are we having this conversation? Right? Like why why are we writing about these things? Why are we advocating for the things? What is the principle at the heart of the matter, right? Otherwise, you get lost in it. It turns into an enterprise, it turns into a business. All of a sudden you're just churning things out to churn things out. <laughs> you, I, I and I truly believe that the answer to authoritarianism, honestly, is healing. I really, truly believe that. I've been working my ass off on that. I've been not only doing it in my personal life in terms of therapy, ketamine therapy, you name it. Like my new book proposal is about getting into the mental health of this country and how it's falling apart. But that has to be solved through personal 
inventorying. And I want to sit down, understand why I'm doing it, what my principles are, why I'm pushing forward and why it is I'm fighting the fight that I am. Oh, well, that is very impressive. Uh, did you, what were the rules around this past, like, was it seven days, five days? Well, <laughs> uh, it was, it was roughly five. I, okay. my, my, my rules are this. I, I want to just travel inward. Right. I, 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 I want to stop interacting with the outside world. I and, and quite frankly, I'm sure there were people who were very glad that I was doing that. I'm sure there are people everywhere who are just like, oh, thank God I had a break from Jared Yates Sexton. And, and, and quite frankly, I, I needed to get in contact with that guy. So, yeah, I, I, I just try and turn everything inward. And listen, does that mean I'm not reading the news? Absolutely. It does not. Absolutely. I'm still because we're sickos, Pete. We can't stop. We will not stop. Even if somebody took your show away from you, you'd still be doing this, just talking to a wall. Same way as me. I just needed to recharge the batteries a little bit. And I walked out of it feeling like I had. I'm ready. I feel like, actually, I feel like my, I feel like my, my, um, my, my, my ratings went up. I feel like on the past couple of days that I've been talking, I've been back to it. I feel like I'm on a new level. I'm proud of it. I'm happy. And maybe I'm selling myself too high right now. And I'm just going to totally disappoint all of your dozens of listeners. Well, and, I don't and, think uh, the first dozen will buy everything. <laughs> that, it's that Did second Lincoln dozen. say that? That was Abraham Lincoln, right? I think it was. I, I'm always quoting different people, especially old Abe. Uh, I, but you, what, what you mean by that is you feel kind of a rejuvenation in terms of getting back to your work and that you feel like it's even resonating more than it did where you were when you, when you left. Well, so here's the thing, My right? Words. So like I'm doing, I'm doing a couple of podcasts a week. Nobody, nobody does what you do. You know what I mean? Like I, I, the fact that you, and this is a testament to you and I'll go ahead and, and I'll sell you up here. Like nobody is able to do this as consistently as you are and still have actual things to offer people, which I, is something I admire tremendously. Well, I mean, it's, I appreciate it, but, but let's be clear. Like my show is guest driven. So every day I get smart people and they talk more than I do. And my, my strength is that I know them and they trust coming on me and I'm able to have the conversation, but it's not like me saying stuff. Let's be, it's, it's, a, it's a lot oh. of, I don't think that's true. I think uh, I think you add to it and I think you direct it. And I think I one of the things and listen, I don't know how we got here, but part of the reason that I like stand up so much is because we basically watch you adding these things and, and improving the conversations and sort of like coming up with these things that you feel and interacting with the world. So I understand why you say that. But I will say as somebody who is also writing Substack articles, who is doing YouTube videos, who's doing all of this shit. Eventually, at some point or another, you have to sort of take stock and you have to say, OK, am I doing this the right way? You know what I mean? Am I am I am I producing things the right way for sure. the right reasons? Am I doing it because I'm on a schedule? Am I doing it because I believe it? And if I feel like I believe it, I can go ahead and renew that and actually go in a different direction. So I just need to take stock. Well, I'm glad that you did. We all are. And glad that you're back. And it sounds like you feel like you benefited from from this exercise. I think that over the past few years, and, and you know, we, we talked a little bit before we started here, um, I think healing and growing and dealing with your shit, I, I think you should be able to see it. Do you know what I mean? I, I do. I think you should be able to sit back and say, hey, this is how I have improved. This is what I yes. have done. And this was another one of those moments, another, you know, trip around the sun that I, um, I sat down. I was like, yeah, I'm improving. I'm getting better. I'm I'm getting better not just as a person, but as in what I'm doing. So yes, I'm I'm ready to go. Uh great to hear it. All right. Well, let's get into some of the news and some of the issues that you're so great to talk about and analyze, including that thing that happened while you're gone. The the former president Donald Trump was indicted. Uh you have a piece about this at your Substack. It was never about patriotism. Uh what is your what is your take on the classified documents case, uh, the indictment of the President of the United States, the first time ever by uh, the, the Department of Justice that we've gotten here. Well, let me go ahead and start by asking a question. How long have we been talking? Uh, regularly like this, three years. It, About or three years, more, right? More, maybe more, a little more. Yeah. Every, and every time that we've ever talked about a Trump investigation, I've given you a pretty stock answer. I've said, I'll believe it when I see it. Yeah. They do not punish powerful, wealthy, white men, particularly ex-presidents. Right? That's fair? Yep. I think he's cooked. Yeah, you've been skeptical about this, and rightfully so, because it's not happened before, and rightfully so in terms of powerful 
uh, people in general, much less white folks, you know, always worth mentioning OJ got away with it. But, but the point is he is not, you, you're saying that you don't think he's getting away with it. You think he's cooked. So we talked about this uh, on the newest episode of the McCraig podcast. I, 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 I said, this is a problem that nobody wanted to deal with. They did not want to punish him. They, they gave him every opportunity to just hand back the documents. You know, no harm, no foul. Let's just move on. It'll be fine. Yes, Pence did this. Biden did this. You name it. Everybody does it. Whatever. Let's just move on. Trump could not go through that process. Couldn't do it. Made it worse time and time again. And not only made it worse, yeah. but made it worse in the most obvious way possible that pushed Garland, that pushed Jack Smith to do yeah. this. We have now reached an intractable point. There was nothing else they could do on this situation. It also doesn't hurt, by the way, that the system is done with Donald Trump. Nobody wants him besides the MAGA group. That That's it. Those are the only people who want him around anymore. I think it's incredible watching Fox News. Brett Baer skewered him, skewered him in a way that CNN couldn't have even have dreamed of. What has happened is we have reached the end of the road with Donald Trump. We now have reached, as I said on the podcast today, it's almost like an impacted bow. Something has to give. You know what I mean? Something somewhere has to go. I still think there's a possibility of him getting pardoned in some way or some sort of a plea bargain because this isn't great for anybody involved in it. But I have to tell you what has been presented at this point. He's cooked based on what has Uh, been given to us. It's been. And I think that he's such an exceptional case because there's almost nobody, even the dumbest criminal well, the dumbest criminal doesn't have the kind of ego and, and, and probably track record that Donald Trump has, but a smart white collar criminal. We have Miranda rights that were hard fought. And when you're arrested, you have the right to remain silent. But Donald Trump went on Fox News and did not. He, he, he keeps admitting to crimes. And even you're talking about, you know, Brett Bayer, but Steve Bannon this morning, he took the tack of. Trump's handlers should have never let him go in there because he doesn't want to directly criticize Trump because he's Bannon and the whole brand. But the point is, like, Bannon's like, that was terrible for Trump. That's what Bannon said. And so everybody seems to agree as to what you're saying. Even a lot of his, like, kind of legal supporters, like, listen, he, he keeps admitting to crimes on TV, right? Yes. And by the way, I, I, I want to put this, I don't want to be inartful about this. I don't want to be... <sighs> not sensitive about this. Like, listen, we have all had somebody in our lives who maybe they're going on a bender. Maybe their lives have careened off the track and we try and help them. We try and talk to them. We try and make sense to them. And eventually it reaches a point in which, and I've heard somebody say this. I I, I had a, a friend of mine who had a, a, a son with a drinking problem. And he said, you know what I pray for? I pray that he'll get pulled over as opposed to having the fatal wreck. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. praying mm. that he'll get a DUI mm-hmm. in order to stop him, which is an awful place to be. <laughs> Donald Trump's pathologies are so baked into the person. They are, they're intertwined. They're inextricable at this point. I've said this before on this show. He didn't particularly want to be president of the United States of America. It was just his privilege and his direction and his momentum was going in that direction. He he doesn't particularly want to run for president again. We have reached the point where he could not stop. And in all of this, like, I'm sorry, but if he wouldn't have run for president again, I do not think he would have been indicted. I want to be serious about how the Department of Justice works, how all of this stuff is skewed, how it all moves. He could not stop. And he can't stop. He can't be silent. And he's going to just continue to go well, down with this thing. I, I hear what you're saying in terms of yeah. the the system, uh, you know, media, politics, activists, a lot are done with him and that he's cooked and he's got. But I mean, I think it's, it's still a pretty sound argument. You, yeah. you basically said that only as MAGA supporters. Well, those are the people who vote in Republican primary. So it's, it would still seem that it's a fair analysis. Anything could happen that he'll win the nomination because of those people voting in red state Republican primaries. Absolutely. And, and more I, importantly, the fact that 10 other people are running against him. So all he needs to get is like 20 yep. percent or whatever the number is, it's going to end up being of Republican voters. So it's it's a you know subset of a subset. 
So here, by the way, like everything that I just said, again, we've been talking for years. You know, that's not in character for me to right. say that. Right. I'm I'm supposed to come on stand up with Pete Dominic and say, no, I'll believe it when I see it. And you need to not worship people like, you know, Jack Smith. Here's where I get back to being Jared Yates Sexton. <laughs> yeah. He can absolutely win the Republican primary. Also, by the way, Fox News, which was skewering him last night, they would absolutely come around and they would get in line and they would shine the boots and they would support him and they would launder him and turn into state propaganda. That could absolutely happen. But I will tell you the way that this thing is moving. I said this and you guessed it on the Muckrake podcast. We were talking about where we thought this thing was going. I said Ron DeSantis is one of the worst in-person politicians I've ever seen. Literally one of the worst. I said to you, I don't know how he could possibly be Trump. If he's up on stage with Trump, I don't think it will work. All of that. I kept saying, you know, this is where everything is trying to move. This is where the donors are. This is where the establishment is. I still think that this story has twists and turns that we're waiting for. Sure. I still think it's very, very weird. Oh, yeah. I think it's unprecedented. I hate that word, but it's it's needed. I still think there's a possibility that Trump is not only the nominee, but president of the United States. I think that is a real possibility. But this thing is going to take so many twists and so many turns, it's almost impossible to predict it. Well, I think one of the things you got to consider is uh, a third party candidate taking from either one of them. And you might argue, as I just did with my dad, uh, about RFK could, you know, I was like, he could take from from Biden. He's running as a, uh, right now as a Democrat. I don't think he gets the nomination, but he could still then go run third party. And my dad said, well, he might take from Trump, too, because he's certainly aligned and been the reason he's running is Steve Bannon is is really behind yep. him. I mean, that's one of the big reasons, of course, that he's running. Uh, what do you think? Because I wanted to ask you if you have paid attention to this, uh, what happened over the weekend with Joe Rogan and RFK and Elon Musk about my friend, Dr. Peter Hotez. But what do you think of, you know, RFK or even Cornell West or anybody else like legitimately or Joe Manchin on low labels legitimately making a run and who they would draw from? Do you think that's possible? Yes, I, I, I think a third party candidate in uh, 2024 is exceptionally likely. I think the RFK Jr. thing, basically at this point, I think it's a phenomenon that has more to do with the fact that a lot of people don't want to see Biden Trump round two. A lot of people don't want to see Joe Biden running for you know reelection. Yeah. And I think that uh, he's a Kennedy. I, I, I think he's got uh, name recognition out the ass. I think once most people start to actually sit down, if you actually look at the number of people who got vaccinated in this country, they're not going to put up with this nonsense. You know, most people were touched by COVID. They watched. Well, half of them died. Them. Half of them died. So, no, I, I, I don't buy this thing that Axios is saying that RFK Jr. is going to win the first two primaries from Biden. I don't believe that. I think that this is a story for people looking for other stories. But I will tell you, the Joe Manchin Noble Labels Party, and for I assume that you've talked about this. I haven't heard you talk about it on the show, but for anybody who hasn't heard it already, this is a corporate party that was created to go ahead and push corporate interest beyond what the Democratic and Republican parties have been. Joe Manchin wants to run for president. He has so many people in his ear telling him that he is going to be the president. He's going to be the savior of the country. They need his moderate voice. They are going to push him and push him and push him. I would not be shocked if he gets in and it makes some sort of a dent in the 2024 election. Yeah. Uh, who is, I don't know who's done the best expose of, of no labels, but uh, the people I trusted, I think when they first started no labels 10 years ago, I think John Huntsman was involved we were all at that very day. We're like, nope, I don't nope. think so. This looks like a way for consultants to make money and donors. And, you know, but this is not a serious thing. And it's Republican. It's conservative. And, or it's very pro corporate, to say the least. It's not the public's and, interest, these people. And by the way, speaking of trips around the sun, you and I have been covering politics for long enough. We know that we're in consultant season. Right. It's when Asa, Asa Hutchinson comes out and is like, I think I can take over the party. Chris Christie comes out and says, I think I can take I, I think I can lead us out of here. And Mike Pence, those are consultants getting checks. That's what's happening. Basically, you go out and you find any narcissist and you say, hey, you know what? I think you're the one. And they say, you know what? I think I am, too. It's like, hey, can you start just direct depositing in my checkbook? And that's I think it's I, right I think now. you're I think you're, you're making it too um, almost like shadowy. It's 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 way easier than that. And anybody who works around campaigns knows you need a campaign 
chief, you need a communications yeah. director, you need a head of fundraiser. There's several yeah. jobs. These are jobs that, that are literally kind of posted internally or even through word of mouth. And someone says, yeah, that, so that's going to be a temporary job, most likely three months. I need yeah. something. It's a lot of money for three months, Very a lot of work, but I'll do it though. knowing the whole time that the candidate has no chance and rarely believing sure. that they do. But it's money. It's job. It, it, it's just a job for a temporary amount of time, a lot of money, and you can yeah. go on to the next one. And the consultant class has turned into a traveling carnival like that. Well It goes ahead and fills this. Up. And on one mm. hand, it's like, hey, by the way, you might not be president, but we can sell your book, it which was... is how this whole thing sort of works. Yeah, yeah. And the consultant <laughs> class builds all that up. That's the season that we're in right now. But when it comes to no labels, what we're actually talking about is a concentrated effort to create a lever within the political scene to go ahead and keep putting the pressure on, which, by the way, is a counterbalance to rising populist and also labor movements. That's what this is about. It's continuing to put the thumb on the scale of all of this. The problem is that a Joe man, I, you, know, you and I both know it'd probably be like Joe Manchin and Larry Hogan is what it would be, probably. Mm. That right there is enough to go ahead and make a difference in 2024. The hope is it can be exposed for what it is and it doesn't move in that direction. But yeah, I do think that there's a possibility that that could play a big role. Where are we now, in your opinion, being uh, an expert on this in many ways, certainly history of it, with the authoritarian movement in the United States of America, the support for authoritarianism over democracy always the biggest question and people frame it different ways and different senses of urgency uh let's have it head over to the the big uh, the magic wall the big screen with jared yates sexton who can show us and illustrate where he thinks the authoritarian movement is in the u.s where it lies where it's- i'm gonna put on my kornacki chinos And I'm going to gesture at the United States of America, almost like a heat wave has settled in a heat dome, if you will, in this environment where we have to learn about these things. What has actually happened is that we have had a rupture in our politics where so much has happened. So much distrust has been sown in for our institutions and the direction of the country. And by the way, I think rightfully so in a lot of a lot of ways that we have reached the point where one of the main ways to have a constituency and in order to gain a movement in this country, see MAGA, make American great again, is to go ahead and sow authoritarian energies to go ahead and say elections don't matter. Laws don't matter. These are things that matter to other people. Go ahead and indulge in your worst instincts. History shows us that that this is what happens whenever orders start to break apart. That's where we are now. All of the little seedlings are there. Everything from Christian nationalism to industrialist and oligarch seeding all of these institutes and think tanks and pushing all these anti-democratic laws and, um, you know, these uh, marginal marginalized communities being targeted. I think Everything- Le- Le- just evidence of that, Leonard Leo, more than anybody, the Federalist uh, more than anywhere. It used to be the Koch brothers, but I think then you could name others, but I just wanted to add a name in there, but go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Everything right now is heading in that direction, which is why I keep screaming from the rooftops that some alternative has to be posed. Everything is there. All of the elements underneath, basically it's like building a house. You have to build the foundation first. The foundation's there. And it's 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 all ready to go. It depends on what direction it goes in. There's so many different things that are going to happen over the next few few years. This Cold War with China, climate change, economic changes, like everything is on the table. The problem, Pete, again, we've been talking for three years. I've been telling you for three years that globalism was coming undone and that a lot of the hard fought victories of the 20th century were coming off the table. The New York Times just ran their first article about globalism coming undone three days ago. Come on. Three days ago. So the the, the problem is that the people who should be on watch for this stuff and ha- should have alternatives for this stuff, they're so far behind. That's the issue on this. And people need to get caught up. Uh, yeah. Well, when we talk about any one part of that, I'm looking at this organization, the Alliance for Defending Freedom, uh, you know, the American conservative Christian legal advocacy group uh, and so many other organizations uh, that are behind the whole Christian nationalism movement, which is focused a lot against laws that protect marginalized communities, but specifically on the LGBT community. It really is an issue that is animating their fundraising as well as, you know, winning elections. And it's being led by, you know, p- politically 
uh, by like people like Governor DeSantis and Governor Abbott and everything that's happening in the in the schools. Take a look at where you're seeing that specific part of the larger movement, the the Christian yeah. fascist nationalists, and we can refer to them interchangeably differently, but they're the same group and movement. Yeah, let's go ahead and start with the veneer, and then we'll move deeper, almost like a tooth. We'll get into the roots of this thing. Okay. All right. On the top of it, this is a story. Ideology is a story that goes ahead and tells you something that you need to believe in order to carry out the things that you want. Right. So basically, Christian nationalism is a larger reality that people can live in, which goes ahead and makes it to where they can sleep well at night, overthrowing elections and persecuting people. Hmm. Basically, God told me I can do this. This is all of this. It's written over here. I do that. Underneath it, you brought up DeSantis. You brought up Greg Abbott. Those are just front men for this. They're the ones who push the buttons, pull the levers. Meanwhile, underneath all of it are a bunch of people who don't believe any of this. Going back to the Cokes, you name it, the, these right wing billionaire donors. They use this to go ahead and go after public education, which they want to destroy. They use this to go ahead and leverage fear and uncertainty, both about modern times, but the future to go ahead and push their political agenda. Meanwhile, you have people, the Christian nationalist, who believe something that isn't real, that is a bastardization of a religion, and it's being leveraged by people underneath. And that's how this whole thing works. It's the story that gets twisted and moved around, and that's how all of this stuff sort of takes shape. And seeing Christian nationalism come into full view, it should be aware that that is the world they're trying to create for people to live in, not something that's real. It's an illusion that can go ahead and go ahead and unleash those authoritarian en- energies that we're talking about. Yeah, for damn sure it is. And it's uh, really effective. It's really effective, oh. really working. I mean, and I, and I want to say something real fast. I had a conversation uh, before I before I went silent. I was talking to someone who was really concerned, you know, I, and it's the same thing. You talk to them, it's something they see on Fox News. The concern is, well, I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about my grandchildren being in school, right? Are they being exposed to things? Are they going to like have people talking to them about being gay or being trans? Are they going to come home with weird ideas or whatever, right? That is something that we can actually have a discussion about. That is actually like, you know, you, you've been in like the, the uh, educational environment where, you know, the rubber meets the road. You can get in places and talk about how this stuff gets talked about, how it gets applied, how a public school should work. The problem is whenever all of a sudden this other thing, they come in. Right. Who is it that are trying to turn kids gay or turn kids trans? For what reason? And it's always, well, they're trying to unseat the country. They're oh, they're trying to destroy the white masculine male because that's the last bastion of defense, you know, of American liberty or whatever, whatever bullshit they want to tell you. The whole point of this is that that story that they tell themselves, it goes ahead and it legitimizes their distrust of people. Right. Instead of saying, well, I feel uncomfortable with this and maybe I shouldn't or whatever. You're having political conversations about something that isn't even actually political. Right. So that story is a really easy poison that can get into the body politic. And that's what Christian nationalism represents. And it's not just Christian nationalists. It's most Republicans at this point are carrying around vestiges of Christian nationalism without even understanding that's what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to wrap my head around that idea that they that they don't even realize that they're talking about it. Certainly, yes, certainly a lot of the supporters and probably many of Republicans in state houses and probably many Republicans even in the U.S. Congress. That is, I think, pretty true. But certainly some I mean, you ever watch these videos where people go and visit an interview or interview Trump supporters at the Trump rallies. And I mean, there it's the exception is when you find somebody and I don't mean to be judgmental too much, but like that is even dressed in granted at a rally, you know, you go to a concert, you wear the hat, I get it. But like, it doesn't look like they're a little off. Like they're, they're, they're somehow, maybe they're not even employed. All right. I'm being a judgmental prick, but I mean like the things that they say, the things that they say are so often bizarre and unreasonable that you're like, oh, there's, there's the, the conversation that you and I are having. They have, we wouldn't even be able to, they don't know what's happening. It wouldn't be able to follow that. They don't get it. So, so there's truth in that. And there's also something that isn't con- like it, it. You're exactly right in feeling that way. And and this is one of the, like, so I mentioned it before we started recording, I'm doing this book proposal for the next project. 
This is a mental health crisis as much as it's a political crisis. Mm. There are a lot of people who are so terrified right now and they're living in this like fight or flight state. They have no idea what's actually happening. They have a lot of stories, a lot of fears, a lot of conspiracy theories, and they are so mixed up in this thing. They have no clue at all what is going on. Meanwhile, there are moments of Clarity, the same thing going back to, you know, I was talking about my my friend who had a son who had like a, you know, a problem with alcohol. There are moments where you can talk. You know what I mean? Like where there's like a, a, sure. a, a ray of sunlight. Yeah. That comes yeah. The problem is that on the right right now, and that isn't to say that there aren't people on the left or the center or wherever sure. you want to say that there, there aren't some of them who are living in that, that have their own things, right? I mean, we've seen misplaced trust. We've seen conspiracy theories among liberals, all of them. No doubt. But on the right, the main animating influence of the right right now, unfortunately, is mental unwellness. It is a lot of people who are really, really terrified, but they don't understand why. They do have reasons to be terrified. There are things for them to be, all of us, to be scared about right now. But they are not actually dealing with what there is to be scared of. They've created other things that go ahead and take the place of it. It's not the same. I've been saying that and feeling that way and saying it in a much simpler way for years and that you are afraid of things that are not happening and will never happen and frankly haven't happened to anybody And you're not afraid of the most dire threats to your health, your community and your country. You're you're missing. And that and and it's and I have empathy for that because I would I see how people think that cell phones are causing brain cancer. Like my cousin believes a lot of that stuff. She was top of her class, not a political person, buys into all this stuff. If I believe that, I, that would suck, man, to think that Wi-Fi is melting my brain and that there's lizard people walking around and, 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 and several other things. Like, I feel for the people who believe those things because it would really be disruptive to my life every day, I bet. And not to mention the vaccines. I mean, I'm arguing, not really arguing with them and engaging them, but, man, they've been coming hard and fast for the past three days over the whole Hotez thing. And these people truly believe that vaccines are killing people. And if I believe I have sympathy for those people, if I believe that I I can't imagine how upsetting that would be to my daily life to think that that was the case. Well, and we all do it in different ways. Part of the issue in all of this is that we sort of selectively see it. You know what I mean? We want to believe that we're all different and there's just like certain groups of people that are like this. We all do it in different ways. And, you know, to go ahead and bring this around and get more intimate, because this is one of those shows where I feel comfortable doing it. I think I can speak for a lot of people. There have been times in my life. And again, this is one of the reasons I need to take a silent sojourn every now and then and take, you know, inventory. Like there have been times in my life Pete, that I have caused problems so that I had to take care of the problems as opposed to taking care of the larger problem. You know what I mean? Like I have, like I have created issues in my life, like chaos in my life that I needed to take care of instead of like spending quiet time thinking about a larger issue that I needed to deal with. Trauma plays a huge role in all of this. And I got to tell you, we are facing a lot of major issues that people don't know how to face. People don't know how to talk about the end of globalism. They don't know how to talk. First of all, they don't even know what neoliberalism is, much less what happens when it reaches its terminal authoritarian phase. Hmm. They don't know. They, they would rather disbelieve that climate change is real as opposed to talking about something that is almost impossible to deal with under a current structure. Those things are so large, they seem undoable. So it's much easier to be like, hey, I'm going to take on vaccines. That's my thing. That's where I'm going to post about it and feel good about it and turn that into my political project. The problem is we are in so much denial, all of us in this country, that we're not taking on the things that actually sort of are at the heart of it. Some of us are doing better. Others are so far away from it that, like like you said, you look at them and you're like, I don't know where you are right now. Yeah, I mean, whether it be an individual and what they're doing in their life or a community or a policymaker. But, yeah, I mean, it's 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 crazy to see that the United States House of Representatives uh, is focused on gas stoves like that's what they're or trans issues, you know, or uh, book banning, like anything that they're doing at the state level. And they're this is policies that they're passing. They're getting rid, they're throwing people off of Medicaid in many states. And then you have obviously Democratic legislatures and people, while we might disagree on many things, believe that government's role should be to make people's lives better in the public interest. 
doing good things and then, you know, being lied about so often. It's it's so often just such a bizarre world. It makes it very frustrating to live in. <laughs> well, what I've realized, and this actually changed a lot for me over the past few months when I started doing research for this new book, I started to realize that the political parties are expression of a psychological point of view. Sure. The Republican Party. So, for instance, right now, what is the cause du jour among the Republicans right now? First of all, Hunter Biden, we're recording this on Tuesday, June 20th. Hunter Biden just pled guilty to crimes. Yep. The Republican Party, which has gone after like Hunter Biden, like gangbusters, they should be celebrating this right now. They're miserable. They're like, this is a slap on yeah, the but wrist. There's a good reason. There's a good reason. There's some good reasons for that for them politically, I think. But I agree. But that's what I'm saying is that the Republican Party is not actually a focused political thing. It goes ahead and it serves the interest of a focused political thing, which you and I were talking about, the billionaire class that goes ahead and funds all the stuff behind the scenes. What are they talking about? They're talking about this thing that Chuck Grassley brought up on the Senate, that they have all these audios of of, of uh, Joe Biden as vice right. president taking a bribe. What did they do immediately, Pete? They said, we don't even know if they exist. Right. That was the everything that they talked about. They're talking about their worst fears and imaginations and they're fighting. And what it turns out, they're projections of themselves. They have their leader, Donald Trump, who has been caught dead to rights in a corruption situation. Right. And what are they doing? They're projecting it outwards and fighting it elsewhere. It is an unhealthy pathology that they are representing and it continues and it gets worse and it gets worse. Well, but you're you're talking about a lot of their political strategy, which is attacking and investigating uh, their opponents. But if you simply looked at legislation proposed, much less passed by democratically led House or Senate or in any state house in the country, that's to me where the rubber meets the road in terms of what matters. Like, what is the what is the legislation that you propose and passed? And whether it be on health care or employment or environment or guns like th- that to me is someone's what did you call it? Their psychological views. Pathology, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like, what are what are the laws they're proposing or to, to do or undo? But that's the whole point is we have reached the point where the ship is going down. There is a group of people who are saying, hey, can we get boats in the water or try and repair the hole? The other side is like, I saw a Kraken. The Kraken did it. And everyone's like, hey, okay, we can talk about the Kraken later. We need to go ahead and make sure this or or the ship is going to make it a different. The ship is going down. And the other side is like, there's chemicals in Ritz crackers. That's right. I can breathe underwater. You know, and it literally, <laughs> it, it, but that is the point is that the Democratic Party and I have my critiques for them and we've gone rounds on this before. I have my problems with them. I believe that they are a lot of them are really bought and sold again. See Joe Manchin. But in all of this, there is no agenda for the Republican Party outside of giving tax breaks to the wealthy and using the power of the state to hurt their enemies. That's it. That's there. There's nothing else. There is no agenda or platform. I said this on the Muckrake podcast this morning. The only thing that the Republican primary is going to be about starting in, uh, in, in, in the primaries, it's going to be, are you going to pardon Donald Trump? That's going to be the main issue. And That's what is a be. woman? And what is a woman? There's not going to be any discussion about making anyone's lives better except for the billionaire donor class. And that's it. That's the only thing that is actual principled or focused. Everything else is just paranoid and scattershot. And drag queens also making sure there's no more drag queens uh, doing things. Scary. Uh, All right. I'll let you go. Anything else? What do you think of the uh, what do you think? I think the just real quick on the what are you laughing at? What a what a nice little end there. I guess I'll let you go. Is there anything else? Well, I didn't more. have like a like wh- I couldn't think of one more question. I didn't want to take a long pause. I didn't want to say uh, I knew I had other things and I forgot what else I wanted to talk about. Give you it me- to me. You me- huh? Give it to me. What's you, you mentioned got? the Hunter Biden thing, and the way yeah. I see that is Republicans are outraged because th- th- what that's going to look like now is that Hunter Biden has pled guilty uh, and it's over. And what they want to do is they want to connect Hunter Biden to Joe Biden, but they can't. They haven't been able to do that. And they're worried about that. And also, of course, they're saying 
you know, Hunter Biden got off easy. And that may well be true. My what I, I've read very little, but uh, my understanding is nobody ever gets prosecuted for the, ch- the gun charge. His gun charge was that he was admittedly using drugs and had a gun, which I'm thinking Republicans would love to make legal anyway. But uh, what do you think of of the reaction, the analysis, uh, you know, different different kinds of treatment for for wealthy? Because when I see it, DOJ under Biden prosecuted the president's son. They did it, but not hard enough, apparently. No, I, I, I've said this over and over. I, I stand, I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that the Republican Party stands by Donald Trump, regardless of what happens. We have to be better than that. And if, if Hunter Biden committed crimes, he should be prosecuted. That's, and he pled guilty. That's where it's at. Yeah, tax evasion and had a gun while he was doing drugs. Okay, but that's, you know, the guy's an addict. The guy's exactly. a serious and, addict. They call him crackhead. Senator Rubio called him a crackhead, yeah. a senator. I know. And by the way, you want to talk about like some real irony, like their constituency suffers from incredible addictions that killed them. They should have empathy. They should care about this Mm. stuff. But I will say if Joe Biden was found to be corrupt and done something prosecutable, I would be one of the first people saying, yeah, hold him accountable. Of course. Of course. That's the way it should work. And in all of this, here's the whole thing. Everybody who says, oh, Biden should pardon Trump. That will get rid of the deep state conspiracy theories. No, it won't. This will not stop. Right. This movement is not going to ever be like, hey, there it is. We have a victory. Put it on the wall. Right. It doesn't matter. It, it wouldn't matter if Hunter Biden went to prison. They would still say it's part of a deep state plot. And 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 that's how it is. They, they are so unhappy. There's never been a group that has shown more that when you have wealth and power and everything you want, it doesn't solve the problem inside of you. That's what the Republican Party is. They have all of the wealth, all of the power, all of the privilege, and it's still not enough. One more thing I did think of talking to. We don't talk about it because we talk about it incessantly and we could talk about any issue incessantly. But I, I think that in news cycles, uh, in, in terms of different issues, change based on any number of things. Women's reproductive rights, abortion, yep. mifepristone. Yep. Uh, birth control like they're come they already came for a lot of it in many red states they, they've got most of it i just think that we don't talk about it because it's there ever present but that's going to be an issue that's going to continue to animate even non-political people because one gender is being punished by the other gender and that's not escaping a lot of people and i i think that we could always just mention it in a conversation about things that are animating people more than anything else Probably gun violence and women's reproductive rights every day, creating activists one way or the other. I couldn't agree more. I, I think it I think it, it's a disgusting thing. I think it's really awful what they have done. Um, I think one of the reasons we don't talk about it more is this red state, blue state dynamic paradigm, I think, yeah. cuts things up. Right. Oh, well, blue states still have reproductive rights. Yeah. The red states yeah. don't. We need to have a national movement that says it doesn't matter what state you live in. You deserve rights. You, you deserve to be taken care of. And the balkanization, the way that that has happened, I think, has been really, really dangerous. This is one of the things that people care the most about. And you're exactly right. People do care, by the way, about voting rights. They care yep. about reproductive yep. rights. Yep. They care about guns. They care about climate change. And by the way, inequality. Let's go ahead and just throw that yeah. onto it. I think there is room to build up a movement based on that stuff, but you can't keep playing games with it the way that I think a lot of that consultant class that you and I talked about, the strategist consultant class wants to play games with it. You have to move on beyond that. You have to have courage and you have to go big. And that's the problem so far. Yeah, well, the Supreme Court's going to probably go big this week on a few more things that we'll have to talk about soon. We didn't even mention the court, but we insinuated towards it. Uh, Well, I feel like you sounded very woke today. Um, and I think that's as, as a result of your silent journey that you went on. Just so. being silent and shotgunning Bud Lights and just like going to town on them and just thank you. You drink shitty beer so- sometimes. Wow. I do, do drink shitty beer. Yeah, sometimes. but you drink, you like good beer, but you, you will drink shitty beer. Is that who you are? I, I am a man of the people who grew up eating bologna and cheese right. sandwiches and hot yeah, dogs. That- Listen. But you don't have to stay loyal to baloney. You're, do, you're like you don't need it anymore. So it's, it would be OK to leave bad beer. If you think that I eat baloney with any regularity, you are dead wrong. 
And I have, I listen, I'll eat bologna once every two or three years. And just the idea of it talking about it right now makes my skin kind of crawl a little bit. All I'm telling you is that I am from Greene County, Indiana. I grew up with certain things. Bologna Sometimes capital, I think. The bologna capital of the world. What a weird word. <laughs> it's awful. No, but uh, yes, every now and then I've been known to enjoy some shitty beer. As long as it's cold, I'll take it. Well, as long I as like to warm. drink things. I don't know if I've said this on this show, Pete. I really like drinking things. Water, coffee, bourbon, beer. I just, if I go out for brunch, my table is a mess. Like, I just want liquids. What won't you drink? Oh, my God. That's a hell of a question. You uh, know, the one thing I don't like drinking when I was the laxative pre colonoscopy. I'll tell you that right now. No, actually, it, well, actually, it was tasteless. I shouldn't even say that it was t- it's what it does to you. But it didn't I didn't go down bad. I don't want to scare when people. When I was like 19, I had what you know, it's one of those where like somebody you knew bought you a bottle of booze and you went to town on it. I, I drank like 20, 22 shots of rum. And like, it felt so bad. You have a sensory never, memory that connects badly to a thing. And so you can't today I drink can't. it. I'm out. I can't do it. Yeah. I'm done. I'm, yeah. I, I just don't have rum in me anymore. I think that's the one thing. Ah, that's interesting. That's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm that way about vodka and grape juice. That was a bad oh. night. Oh, that just made my skin crawl a little bit too. This is a really rough. And I had a bologna interview. sandwich just before, so it was rough, layered oh, thick, Pete, that layered is, real that thick. Is, Ooh, I just lost actual weird. subscribers. Thank you, Jared. Always a pleasure, my friend. I appreciate you so much. Thanks, Pete. Yeah, there he goes, Jared Yates Sexton. How about it, huh? What'd you think? Did you like? Do you like? At Jared Yates Sexton, go subscribe to the Substack. Collapse dispatches from a collapsing state. Get his books. I didn't even mention his the names of his books. Just published last year, The Midnight Kingdom, A History of Power, Paranoia, and the Coming Crisis. American Rule, How a Nation Conquered the World but Failed Its People. And The Man They Wanted Me to Be, Toxic Masculinity and a Crisis of Our Own Making. Jared Yates Sexton, always great. Thank you guys very much for listening. Please subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already. And you can do that by going to standupwithpete.com or patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. That's all I've got for you today. I look forward to talking to you tomorrow, hearing from you anytime. Stand up with Pete at gmail.com. And you're never alone if you're a member of our community. You can always hang out with us in the Discord platform. And that's all i got. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Oh, sorry to you bumblebees who joined me here all the way at the end. I had the music way too loud at the end. That's my bad. Thank you to all those of you who reached out to me. And since it's John Lewis, John Lewis's stamp unveiling, let's go to a John Lewis quote. He said, never let anyone, any person or any force, dampen, dim, or diminish your light. Release the need to hate, the harbor division, and the enticement of revenge. Release all bitterness. Hold only love, only peace in your heart, knowing that the battle of good to overcome evil is already won. John Lewis, thank you very much. John Carroll, sing us out. No need to point your rifle to defend your town. Just stand up. Stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down. Boy, you better stand up. Stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. She's the place where every lost child will finally be found. There's only one thing to do. Before we stand our ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up Alright, we got to speak up We got to reach
pressure and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be told up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no ones and try to rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside. And listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says stand up. 